What is up guys, welcome back to a brand new reaction and today we're watching the history of Britain in 20 minutes. Now I don't know how the heck they're going to condense the thousands and thousands of years of Britain history into 20 minutes, but we're going to see. Today we're making up for everything that my history teachers left out. Well I guess they didn't leave it out, the, the curriculum or whatever, you know. Because <laughs> for the most part we barely learned anything if it didn't have to do with America when it came to the UK's history. So anything before, you know, we wanted to go our separate ways and go over here and do all that I don't really know that much like I know there was Vikings in the UK at one point but that's about it so today we are here to learn so we're about to get into it go on YouTube channel hit that subscribe button drop a like you want to see more reactions like this and yeah this is the first reaction I'm posting with a hundred thousand subscribers I appreciate you guys so much it's all thanks to you guys and yeah the next video after this we're gonna be talking about that UK theme tattoo so y'all stay tuned but other than that let's get into it Why does that guy kind of look like me? <laughs> the dude on the right kind of looks like me. The United Kingdom is a nation located in the British Isles, made up of England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. Thousands of years ago, the Isles were inhabited by long forgotten pre-Celtic people, known as the Beaker Culture, named for their distinctive pottery beakers. Little is known of them, but it has been suggested that these people laid the foundations for the mysterious Stonehenge. Dang. A series of heavy standing stones which were transported from 150 miles away. And a of, of course the people that did Stonehenge, we don't know that much about them. Like, the whole thing is just a mystery, bro. <laughs> ...used to form a calendar, marking the days of the summer and winter solstice. Over time, waves of Celtic-speaking people arrived from the European continent, who soon came to form the Britonic, Gaelic and Pictish people. These people were not a unified people, but were rather many tribes who shared a similar pagan religion, language and culture. The Romans invaded conquering what's now England and Wales, but failed to conquer the Pictish tribes to the north. The Romans launched several campaigns into this land they called Caledonia. However, their fortifications were soon overrun and abandoned, and they retreated to Hadrian's Wall. Their conquered lands were incorporated into the Roman Empire, becoming the province of Britannia. They brought Roman customs and laws, improved infrastructure, and connected many towns and cities with Roman roads. When the Romans left, there was a great migration of Germanic tribes. These were the Jutes, Angles, and Saxons, with their language Old English. Their settlement pushed many Britons to areas in Wales, Brittany, and a kingdom known as Dumnonia, while Scotland eventually evolved into four kingdoms. Bro, 410 CE doesn't even make sense to me. Like, how, how long ago was that? That's insane. The smallest of these were the Scots, who were originally from Ireland, the Britons of Strathclyde, the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Bernicia, and the Picts of Alba. For unknown reasons, the Jutes disappeared from history, but the Angles and Saxons eventually formed seven kingdoms. Wessex, Sussex, Kent, Essex, East Anglia, Mercia, and Bernicia became Northumbria. After the collapse of Dumnonia, the remaining territory of Cornwall fought against the powerful kingdom of Wessex. Cornwall eventually fell under the control of Wessex, but it managed to keep its own culture. Wales at this point was also made up of several separate kingdoms, the largest being Gwynedd in the north, Powys in the east, and Dufford to the south. It seems like everything always starts with like smaller kingdoms and like smaller groups of people, and then eventually somebody more powerful and bigger comes and takes them, and then they're like, okay, I guess we'll just join y'all now, and that's how you eventually get like the one big kingdom together. <laughs> the British Isles soon saw numerous Norse raiders from Scandinavia. These were the Vikings, and they began settlement on many of the Scottish Isles, the Isle of Man, and they even founded the city of Dublin in Ireland. Bro, I want to watch more videos on the Vikings, because Vikings are just so interesting to me. Like, they, they don't... Because you see them in the movies, and you don't really understand that these were real dudes. Like, these were real people at one point. But for me, it's just weird to think like they were actually real people because I just seen them on like movies and stuff. So that's crazy. The Scots and the Picts then decided to unite under Kenneth MacAlpine to form the Kingdom of Alba. The Kingdom of Alba grew strong over the years, and eventually Strathclyde was brought into the fold. 
Meanwhile, Danish Vikings arrived in the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms for conquest. After fighting the King of Wessex, Alfred the Great, the Dane law was formed, a land where the laws of the Danes held influence over the Anglo-Saxons, controlling the region and its affairs. It's crazy how much, like, the the power, like, shifted. Like, yeah, they had it for, like, a couple hundred years, and then now these people came in and took it over for however long, and these people came in. Like, it just bounced back and forth so much. The Anglo-Saxons eventually defeated the last Viking king of York, Eric Bloodaxe, and Athelstan became Bruh, the we, first- We watched a video on that. Imagine going to battle against a dude named Eric Bloodaxe. No! No! <laughs> like, he was built for one thing, and that's going to war. <laughs> like, that's king insane. Of the English. Although, the newly formed Kingdom of Denmark would conquer England and even found a short-lived Danish dynasty under Canute. The Norsemen had a dramatic impact on the Isles, so it's no that wonder some bad. words in the English language have Norse origin. After defeating formidable sea raiders from Ireland, the Western Isles, Scandinavia and Anglo-Saxon forces from Mercia, Griffith ap Llywelyn subdued his rivals in southwest Wales. Llywelyn became the only Welsh king ever to rule over the entire territory of Wales. He was defeated by the English Earl Harold Godwinson and killed by his own men leading to the Welsh kingdoms splitting apart once more. At the death of Edward the Confessor, there was a succession dispute between four claimants. Harold Godwinson was elected as king, and managed to defend England from an invasion by the Norwegian king Harold Hardrada. However, Harold had to march his army south to defend against Duke William of Normandy, who had crossed the English Channel. According to tradition, at the Battle of Hastings, Harold was killed by an arrow to the eye, and the Norman invaders were victorious. Damn! The new King William defeated a number of rebellions, built a new design of castles called Moat and Baileys, and introduced a number of reforms, like Trial by Combat and the Doomsday Book. Dang! The Norman so he built the first moat? That's insane! ...invaded into South Wales and parts of Ireland, creating the Lordship of Ireland. At court, nobles spoke and conducted sessions in the Anglo-Norman language, which endured for centuries and left an incredible mark in development of modern English. After a brief civil war, Henry II would marry Eleanor of Aquitaine, establishing the Angevin Empire, beginning a long rivalry against France. Huh. Richard the Lionheart defended much of this territory, and also became a central Christian commander during the Third Crusade achieving considerable victories against his Muslim counterpart, Saladin. Under King John, heavy taxes were imposed on his barons in order to pay for his expensive foreign wars. The barons rebelled and forced John to sign the Magna Carta, a charter that established the principle that everyone was subject to the law. We did learn about the Magna Carta. That's one thing like we actually did learn about in school. <laughs> guaranteeing the rights of individuals, the right to justice, and the right to a fair trial. Most of North Wales remained independently ruled by several Welsh princes, until 1216, when Llywelyn the Great became the ruler of the Principality of Wales. This would be the case until Edward I, who conquered Wales in 1284, effectively becoming part of England. At the death of King Alexander III, Scotland was left with 14 rivals for succession. To prevent civil war, the Scottish magnates asked Edward I of England to elect a claimant. John Balliol was elected king, but was constantly undermined by Edward, who opposed Scottish independence. Edward decided to launch several campaigns to conquer Scotland and depose King John, to which he acquired the nickname Hammer of the Scots. Dang. Under a brave Scottish knight, William Wallace, the Scots mounted resistance against the English, defeating them at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. Edward marched north in person and defeated Wallace in battle, but Wallace managed to escape. He was later captured and executed, but his efforts allowed Robert the Bruce to rise up and defeat the English, securing Scottish independence. There we go. When the King of France died without an heir, Edward III was technically eligible to the crown, through his mother. The French court denied his claim and instead installed Philip of Valois. Edward paid the homage heck? to Philip as he owned the lands of Gascony, and was essentially a vassal to the King of France. Due to disagreements, Edward reasserted his claim to the throne and invaded France beginning the Hundred Years' War. That's how that started? Wow. The English achieved notable victories at the Battle of Crecy, Poitiers and Agincourt thanks to the technical superiority of the longbow, 
but was unable to conquer the French with the appearance of Joan of Arc, who lifted the French spirit and turned the tide of the war. Bruh. Upon the death of Edward III, an entire generation was skipped in the line of succession, which prompted bitter rivalry between several claimants. Most notably were the Houses of York and Lancaster. Tensions were high until a bloody age of warfare erupted between these two factions in the Wars of the Roses. It's so in-depth and complicated this period will likely become a video of its own. The wars ended with the arrival of the Tudor dynasty, Henry VIII wanting a divorce split with the church creating his own Church of England. Huh. This ultimately led to a series of religious differences between future English monarchs. In between his six wives and naval adventures, Henry gave Wales <laughs> just his six wives like <laughs> representation in Parliament and created the Kingdom of Ireland. But realistically, he only controlled an area known as the Pale. In addition, Henry's paranoia and suspicion amounted to tens of thousands of executions, Dang. including his friends and wives. During the 16th that century, sound the like largest you're, you're too good at friends with them if you're executing them. The most powerful empire was Spain, under King Philip II. England, under Elizabeth I, were helping Dutch rebels reject Spanish rule, and many English privateers were also intercepting Spanish silver on its journey back <laughs> from the New World. This angered the Spanish king, and the final straw came when Elizabeth had Mary Queen of Scots executed because she did not want Scotland falling under Catholicism. Damn! The Spanish Armada, consisting of 130 ships, was deployed to invade England. At the Battle of Gravelines, an English victory forced the Spanish fleet to sail around the British Isles, before storms in the north of Scotland destroyed the remaining ships. In retaliation, the English, led by Sir Francis Drake, amassed their own armada to invade Spain, but this too became a failed endeavour. Born in this period, William Shakespeare became a renowned poet, playwright and actor, who contributed significantly to English literature. When Queen Elizabeth of England died without an heir, her closest male relative was James VI of Scotland. James was elected as King of England and Scotland in a personal union, although the countries remained separate political entities. As the first monarch to rule the entire island of Great Britain, several assassination attempts were made by Catholic conspirators. One such assassination attempt was the gunpowder plot by Guy Fawkes, who tried to blow up Parliament. Damn! After Bro, a failed it seems like colony, money, power, and religion it just caused all of this. Like that's what the world has always been ran on, and it I guess it always will. Like as Roanoke, England established a successful colony known as Jamestown, which would eventually evolve into the Thirteen Colonies. Yeah. At first, expeditions to the New World were mainly driven by religious motives, which were predominantly to convert the natives to their faith. But colonies became more profitable, as demand for New World crops like tobacco and sugar increased. British ships also made a monopoly on the transportation of captive African slaves that crossed the Atlantic to the Americas. Millions of Africans were shipped in cramped, horrific conditions to work on brutal plantations in the Americas, and essentially became property to their masters. For 300 years this practice continued in the British Empire, until it was fully abolished in 1833. This period also saw a wave of plantations in Ireland, where Irish lands were confiscated and given to English and Scottish settlers. Tensions would rise between Charles I and Parliament, Following disagreements, conflicts between royal and parliamentary authority within England led to the English Civil War. The country became divided between parliamentarians, known as the Roundheads, and royalists, known as the Cavaliers. Under Oliver Cromwell and the New Model Army, the parliamentarians defeated Charles and executed him for treason. Weren't they like all together like a hundred years ago? Now they're completely split up again. <laughs> Cromwell became Lord Protector and dissolved the monarchy but shortly after his death, it was restored under Charles II. Charles II married Catherine of Braganza, and when she arrived from Portugal, she introduced the greatest beverage of all time. Tea. <laughs> tea had been used I knew it. I knew it. I mean, hey. by China for centuries, but its arrival in the 17th century captured the interest of the English aristocracy, and soon captivated every other Englishman. In 1685, a Catholic James II became king in a largely Protestant nation. James's daughter Mary and her Dutch husband William were both Protestant, and many nobles unhappy with the Catholic king invited William to become king. William found considerable support when he invaded, and he was soon crowned King William III in what became known as the Glorious Revolution. 
Although William's supporters dominated the government, there remained a significant following for James II in the Scottish Highlands. Clan MacDonald of Glencoe was one such group who had not been prompt in pledging allegiance to the new monarch. For this reason alone, 38 members of the clan were murdered in what became known as the Massacre of Glencoe. Damn. After Scotland's failed colonial endeavours in Nova Scotia and Panama, and an economic crisis in the 1690s, there was a union between England and Scotland, forming the United Kingdom of Great Britain. There we go. The House of Stuarts had ruled Britain for just over a century, but ended with the death of Queen Anne. Sophia of Hanover was the granddaughter of James I, and her son George became king. Great Britain soon found itself drawn into several European wars, most notable being the War of the Spanish Succession and the Seven Years' War. Victories in these wars resulted in territory for the empire, particularly in North America, although it resulted in considerable debt. In order to make up for this debt, King George III ordered heavy taxes be placed on the 13 colonies. This, among other reasons, culminated into the American War of Independence, and with financial help from France and Spain, the Americans were victorious. The East India Company, which was founded by Elizabeth I, had grown rapidly. Bro, I didn't know that was a real thing, because, like, that's in uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. I always heard that, but I never knew it was a real thing until I started, like, actually watching these videos and learning about it. And even operated its own military and controlled a sizable amount of territory. The company had set up fortified warehouses where they traded with many Indian rulers, acquiring important luxuries like textiles and spices. One of the most important cities of all was Bengal, as it had a large taxable population. The governor of Bengal, Robert Clive, ordered that the population grow opium to export to China, instead of growing food as it proved to be a great source of income. Damn. However, when a famine struck, it resulted in the deaths of millions of people. Meanwhile, Captain James Cook arrived at New Zealand and the southeast coast of Australia, although he wasn't the first to discover the area because of past Portuguese and Dutch explorers. However, unlike the Dutch and Portuguese, Britain claimed it as their new penal colony, known as New South Wales, with the first convicts arriving in 1778. So basically, Britain used to own, like, everything. <laughs> A new threat had emerged from France, French Emperor Napoleon Bonaparte. Nah, no, I've seen it. I've seen the warning. Damn. Napoleon had come to dominate most of Europe, but Britain's advantage was that she was an island, and the Royal Navy had become a major force at sea. Invasion of Britain was near impossible, and in a series of coalitions, Napoleon was defeated. By the end of the Napoleonic Wars, Britain was growing rapidly into a superpower based on their supremacy of naval engineering. And it's really crazy how a small island like that has impacted the world so much. Like, literally everything has been impacted about by the UK. Like, everything, bro. And it's just a small little island. Like, it's insane. Furthermore, in Ireland, the Great Famine struck. A disease killing potato plants. Portators. Ireland, which had merged with Britain, relied heavily on this crop for food. But the British government forced Ireland to export what little food they had to other areas. Without any aid or food, Ireland's population plummeted by half Damn. due to starvation and emigration to countries like the United States. Things weren't looking so great in India either, as India was rebelling against company rule. The East India Company had employed many Indian soldiers known as Sepoys, who were under the command of British soldiers. These Sepoys grew increasingly unhappy, and a revolt soon occurred, yet it quickly failed due to a lack of unity between Indians. After the rebellion, the British government took direct control, with Queen Victoria being declared Empress of India. Damn. During the 19th century, the world was forever changed by the Industrial Revolution. Society was transformed by technological advances and increasing mechanisation, and would launch Britain to global dominance. Some of the greatest innovations and inventions were the sewing machine, the fire extinguisher, steam-powered engines and turbines, the electric motor and photography. The telegraph was also a major invention, as a message could now be sent from Britain to India in a matter of Bro, hours. The UK Peace. has literally given us everything. <laughs> Y'all came up with all of it. <laughs> Establishment of railways and trains also transformed transport forever. Instead of travelling days by horse and carriage, it now only took a matter of hours by train. 
engineering and communication advances not only united the empire, they triggered a manufacturing boom like no other. People flocked from rural areas to city centres for jobs. Productivity reached an all-time high, but the consequences of mass migration resulted in extremely cramped and polluted cities. However, with these problems that were generated, it resulted in an improved sewage system. Newcastle focused on shipbuilding, Manchester the cotton industry, Liverpool became a major trading centre, Middlesbrough fixated itself on iron and steel works, the presence of iron ore, limestone and large coal deposits in the West Midlands and South East Wales prompted the establishment of ironworks, and Scotland boomed in the linen industry. The Victorian era also saw a major change in society, as families from the poorest backgrounds gained access to education, although it was much stricter than today's standards. The 1860s also saw the rise of the greatest food combination ever, fish and chips. What the <laughs> Towards the end. <laughs> First the greatest drink ever, now the greatest food combination. Hey, I can't be mad at it. I can't be mad at it. End of the 19th century, European powers came together at the Berlin Conference to divide Africa between them. A group in South Africa known as the Boers, who were originally Dutch settlers, proved difficult for the British. The Boers lived in two nations, the Free Orange States and the Republic of Transvaal, and both resisted British rule using guerrilla warfare. Dang. To counter this, the British placed many women and children in their tens of thousands into concentration camps, where many died from starvation and disease. Damn. Britain became a major player in the First World War, and many men proudly volunteered to serve and protect their country. The Great War, as it was called, saw the use of new technology, such as dreadnoughts, warplanes, artillery, machine guns, grenades, chemical weapons, bolt-action rifles, and the first use of the tank. Damn. Many faced horrific conditions in the trenches and witnessed gruesome battles. Millions died and many returned home shell-shocked by what they had seen. The Empire reached its territorial height in 1921 after gaining territory from Germany and the crumbling Ottoman Empire. The Empire now ruled over 400 million people and controlled one quarter of the world's landmass. Damn! But the reality was, Britain could no longer afford to build bases or ships to defend its empire as it had before 1914. Ireland finally managed to break away from British rule and formed the Irish Free State and shortly after became a republic. So that wasn't that long ago. I didn't know. I thought like, I thought Ireland became its own thing like hundreds of years ago. It wasn't that long ago. That's insane. The Second World War was more brutal and horrific than the first. Most of Europe had fallen under German occupation and under Prime Minister Winston Churchill, Britain stood strong during the Battle of Britain and the Blitz. Britain were extremely successful at intercepting and decoding enemy communications, with the likes of Alan Turing who cracked the German Enigma code. The war ended with an allied victory but many nations within the empire felt a desire for independence and it was clear the empire was about to break. India was one such nation who were ready to declare their independence. Mohandas Gandhi practiced a non-violent approach and this proved successful as shortly after India gained independence. The Commonwealth of Nations was formed to improve relations and economic ties with former colonies. This still remains today with 53 members united by language, history, culture and shared values of democracy. The British Empire officially ended with Hong Kong, Britain's last colony, being handed over to China in 1997. Wow! The Empire committed many atrocities on many different people, imposing their culture and civilization while often wiping out native ones. On the other hand, this brought about globalization and the uniting of the modern world. And without such innovations and industrialization, the world might have been a very different place. Thanks. The United Kingdom suffered a small economic recession in 2008, but has since recovered. It is a multicultural society with each region retaining a presence of its history and culture. If you ever visit, look out for the Welsh cake, the haggis, the whiskey, the Chelsea bun, the Parmo, the Cumberland sausage, the Yorkshire pudding, or the Cornish pasta. Now you're speaking my language. Food. The UK remains a member of NATO, United Nations, and the World Trade Organization, and uses the pound currency. In 2016, a referendum resulted in 51.9% of voters in favor to leave the European Union. 
Although the countries within the United Kingdom became divided on the matter, leading to the many questions of its future unity. Right, say, what was it, 51.9%? That's really, really close to split right down the middle. Wow. Wow. That, honestly, was one of the best videos I think I've ever watched. That was... Whoa. They did, I think they did a pretty good job. You know, as, as well as you can summarize the thousands and thousands of years of history. That was pretty good, bro. I didn't know most of that stuff. Like, up until really America got involved, I didn't really know nothing. But y'all let me know what y'all thought about it down in the comments. If y'all want to see more reactions like this, let me know by hitting that like button. If y'all new to the channel, hit that subscribe button. Thank you guys so much for watching. Make sure I go out today. Spread love. Spread kindness. Do something nice to somebody today. I love you guys so much. I really do. JJ Rax and I'm out. Peace.